be on behalf of the Studio for Southern California History and at the Federal Graduate University. Uh, before beginning, I'd like to recognize the special guests in the audience uh, who've been essential to putting this together. Uh, the studio director, Sharon Seacon. Uh, Suzanne Bischoff, who lent us these beautiful pieces by Leo Cody, who you're going to be able to enjoy them after the lead panel. So, Suzanne, thank you. Uh, Mary Jo, who is also known as Moi Moi, she's in the audience. And Christopher Mounty, Christian, that he has been vital in helping us last minute and putting everything up. So, Christopher, oh. somewhere. He's in the back. Okay. <laughs> uh, I want to introduce our moderator, and then I'll hand it over to him. Uh, Dr. Matthew Benavides works and creates at the intersection of media, the arts, and education. He is the managing director of public communication strategies, the award winning author of seven books, senior editor for Lectura Books, and a consultant on policy and media issues for national, cultural, and academic institutions. He is a former adjunct faculty member at UCLA and resident scholar at UCLA's Chicano Studies Research Center, and has been published extensively at, um, on a wide range of topics. In 2007, the University of Minnesota Press published his book on Grom, a seminal artist in the LA art scene. Max is a former, es former essayist for the LA Times and has worked in TV and public radio as a producer and currently blogs for the Huffington Post. He received his undergraduate and graduate education at UCLA and his PhD in New Media, Diversity, and Higher Education at Claremont Graduate University in May. For Max, Leo Politi was a groundbreaking artistic and cultural force in LA history who was ahead of his time. So I'll go ahead and pass this over to Max. Yeah. So give a round of applause. Thank you, Jennifer. It is uh, an honor to be here and an honor also to be asked to moderate uh, this stellar panel on uh, Leo Paletti. I, I want to give you a little bit of background on him, and uh, but also let you know how the panel is going to work. I'm going to introduce all the panelists, and then each of the panelists will make a brief opening statement, and then we're going to have a conversation, a dialogue here uh, with all of our, our panelists. And after we've uh, conversed for a while, dialogue, we're going to open it up uh, for comments, questions from the floor. So again, thank you all for coming. And this, to me, this panel itself is historic. But here we are in 2011 honoring, uh, you know, Leo Pelletti, who was an artist and author, who wrote and illustrated over 20 children's books, as well as Bunker Hill, Los Angeles, published in 1964, which was for adults. Uh, Pelletti's murals are visible throughout LA, most notably, notably in Chinatown at Castellar Elementary, and at the Pueblo Historic Monument and his blessing of the animals, probably many of you have seen them. Uh, Pauletti's works often celebrated cultural diversity and were published in both English and Spanish. He depicted stories that were rooted in new locality and his passion for using sketching as a means of remembering complemented his desire to tell the tales of communities that were being erased and transformed before its very eyes. At the end of Bunker Hill, uh, Pauletti writes, quote, can we really call it progress when it means the extension of our leading landmarks of known historical, ascetic, and sentimental values? By destroying all our islands of heritage, we are not only erasing the continuity of our city's history, but above all, we are denying our children the precious knowledge of the past, which would greatly enrich their lives. In ending, I would like to say what little value of this work we have, it has been a work of love, and also of protest, end quote. Beautifully put. And uh, I think it tells us why we're here today. Let me introduce the panelists so you know who you're going to be uh, hearing. I'd like to start with uh, Frank Young, who is Moy Moy's older brother. Frank spent much time watching real work when he was a youngster. He also had several encounters with him when he was an adult. Very lucky guy. <laughs> he retired from the uh, Los Angeles Police Department in 2003, and is now enjoying the fruits of his life. It was not until Frank became involved in the Leo Politi Centennial Celebration that he realized what Leo was doing with some of his works. So, so Frank, welcome, and we'll be here to you in a few minutes. Round of applause, please. 
Uh, Fabrizio Espasande is part of a team uh, producing a video archive and full-length documentary on Alvera Street. Uh, he started this in the year 2000. An important part of this effort is documenting the role of Leo in Overa Street. Fabricio is a USC School of Architecture graduate and organizes cultural events for the Cervantes Center of Arts and Letters, a local nonprofit organization. Fabricio, welcome. <laughs> Ellen Dago, who's to my left, uh, came to know Leo Poletti through her husband, Joe. Joe, where are you? Okay, <laughs> because Joe has been a longtime friend of Paul, Leo's son. So, Joe, thank you for being here. Ellen, thank you. Ellen and Joe own a screen printing business in South Pasadena and enjoy uh, Leo's, many Leo, of Leo's works that they have in their home. So, we have a very wonderful panel. Now, I want to introduce Ann Stalka, who's going to open our panel by making a, a, a statement about Leo. Ann Stalka is an author and elementary school teacher. She grew up in England and moved to the U.S. in 1963. Leo Poletti, Artist of the Angels, is her ninth children's book. Other books include On the Home Front, Growing Up in Wartime England, an autobiographic account of her childhood experiences during World War II. Already an admirer of Leo, she first met him in the early 1980s. Over the years, she and Leo would get together many more times. This book that she wrote was based on those meetings and the interviews she conducted with his numerous friends, family, and families. And thank you for being here. Anne said as a, as a teacher, she doesn't need the mic. This is also going to show us a few things. So we'll start out without the mic. But let me know if you can't hear me. Okay, I'm just going to be talking to a great many children. Um, I want to explain where my interest in Leo came from first. Um, I started at a school downtown in 1977. And at the same time, we received a new librarian. And she was passionate about Leo's books. And almost every single uh, library lesson, and she was a teacher librarian, she used one of Leo's stories. And they were very important to the children, especially the Mexican children who were just beginning to come to that school. It was an all black school. And I loved those stories. I loved the visual aids that she enriched her stories with. And I had to meet this man. And she showed me a photograph of him painting his mural at Alvera Street. If you can't see it, I'll lay them out afterwards for you to see. And if you can't hear at the back, then please raise your hand. So here he is painting his mural, and I'm sure you've all seen it. It's in the blessing of the animals. Um, so after I saw that photograph, we already loved Los Angeles, loved Alvera Street in particular, and we went there many, many times already. Now we were on a hunt. We were looking for Leo. I just had to meet him. And so I finally met him one day with my mother, who's an artist, so I made it lovely special. And as you can see, my hair has changed color over the years. <laughs> but uh, here we are, our very first meeting with Leo. And we patiently watched until he finished his uh, drawing of a girl in a Mexican costume. And then when he was done, we introduced ourselves and we kept in touch from then on. That was probably the last 20 I should show of the pamphlet. <laughs> that was probably the last 20 years of his life. Now, when Leo first arrived in Los Angeles, he had a hard time deciding where to live because he was looking for inspiration. All artists are looking for inspiration, something that makes them want to paint. And when he saw Alvera Street, he said, I thought I was in heaven to find this street, because he had found the place that was going to inspire him as an artist. Now, getting into picture book writing was almost an accident. He was allowed to in on their screen every day, and by sheer chance, and his son gets very upset when I say he was lucky, but he was lucky. I'm sorry, Suzanne. He was lucky. He met not one, but two editors, and both of them offered him a contract. 
Now, this was his first character who became a book, Little Pancho. And apparently the Mexican people in Montgomery Street weren't wild about this style. They didn't like being depicted by the, in this way. And his second character is what really brought him some attention. This is Pedro, the angel of Alvera Street. And this was with a different publisher who was, I don't know if you could say, his fairy godmother. But she had him do many, many books for her. And she, he illustrated many of her books. So this is Pedro, the angel of Alvera Street, which has become a very, very well-known, very special book because it's a really story. Now, as you know, Chinatown is very close to Alvera Street. So if there was no action, let's say, in Alvera Street, we'd wander over to Chinatown. And he told me that he liked to sit by the wishing well there, and he would sketch. The children would come flying out of Mr. Chun Hoon's, Dr. Chun Hoon's school, and they would see him sketching, but they'd kind of ignore that because he had his little dogs. So the dogs were what drew their attention. So he was able to freely sketch. And he sketched and sketched and sketched many sketches of um, the children getting ready for the lion, the lion parade, Chinese New Year. But he didn't have a story. Now, as far as I know, and I believe Moi Moi told me this, the brothers, of which this is one, took Moi Moi to see Leo in Robinson's department store, where there used to be one downtown that had a wonderful bookstore inside. And they said to Leo, this is the character for you. And so Moi Moi was obviously the character. Here she is when I met and interviewed her. She's right there. <laughs> but I thought this was a good one to show the show. Children are always impressed to see that someone is real. <laughs> they can't believe they're grown up, but anyway, they're very impressed. Now, as many of you who know Leo know, he did not usually, Ellen's a friend, so she probably is the exception, he did not take his clients, his interested customers, to his home. Very rare. I imagine Bill Chun Hu was one of the people who went. But this was his office, Philippines. If you wanted to meet Leo, we wrote to him, and he said, I will meet you. He wrote back. Sometimes he phoned and said, I will meet you at such and such a time at Philippines. And you had your lunch, and then he took you out and set up this incredible car show in his car. <laughs> now, if you bought a book from Leo, and there are several more examples on the storyboards, he always painted a picture inside. Always. And he took a lot of time over that picture. So it made the book very special. And he always, even if he just met you that moment, he always spoke to my friend. Always. Everyone was his friend. And I'd like to read a quote from Jack Smith, who was a columnist for the Los Angeles Times. He wrote that Kaliti is the world's slowest autographer. <laughs> I once saw him signing books in a bookstore, and although the line was long, he took his time making each autograph a work of art. When he signed my book, elaborately as before, he looked up at me, the wise owl eyes smiled. Do you want birds? He asked. I asked for birds. Now, Jack Smith was a huge fan of Leo's. Now, 20 picture books have been published, and he began to realize that Los Angeles was disappearing, the Los Angeles that he loved and knew. Bunker Hill, where he had started his married life, was disappearing. And so he began by driving the people at City Hall mad, trying to get them to realize they should save this piece of Los Angeles history. And they just hated to see him coming. So he eventually had to get up and he realized the only way to save Los Angeles 
was to paint pictures on it and preserve it in that way. So he did this wonderful book called Bunker Hill. Um, we have a picture up here also, but this is one of the many pictures. And on each page were these incredible, eloquent, beautifully written stories about the people who lived in the houses and their stories of what it was like to live in Los Angeles. Huh? Oh, <laughs> you were pointing, I'm sorry. So it is, oh, it's there? Okay. It was such an eloquent book, and that um, quote you read was just incredible. I mean, you really realized what a phenomenal writer he was when you read that book. And then he got um, terrified that the festivals in Los Angeles would disappear as well. And so he recorded the festivals in a book called Quinsetia, which we have over here. <laughs> Thank you. And so um, everything that he could see disappear, he recorded. And the only thing that he painted that is still there is Redlands up here. Yeah, I have a man of white with me. <laughs> now, Leo was desperate, but he never told anyone to have a school named after him. He spent much of his life visiting schools, and he loved children. They were the angels of Los Angeles. And eventually, a man he made friends with, well, actually, he hadn't met at that time, was uh, going to be the principal of a new school. And he said to him, who in the area of literature was the biggest influence in your life. And he said, Leo Pelletti. And they all looked fairly blank. And he said, well, isn't he still alive? And they said, yes. No school is named after someone who's still alive. But Leo got his wish, or at least the principal got his wish. And we now have Leo Pelletti Elementary School downtown, 12th, 11th Street. And then I'd like to end with a quote and then a picture, my favorite, favorite picture. But you know, I completely overlooked talking about the research. And I have to thank many of the people in this room for helping me with this book. Because Leo did not tell me about a few books, so I missed a really good one here. But um, he did not want to talk with me at the time. And so it was the best thing that Paul could have done for me. He gave me a couple of names, and I started there. One of them was this Dr. Bill Chanun, who had a stack of material that just blew me away. And a couple of other people also had collected everything that was ever written about Leo. And it was like this giant spider web trying to fit it all together. For the most part, the facts it, but in some cases they didn't, and more research was necessary. I interviewed people in Alvarez I hunted by and low for Moi Moi, because everyone was convinced she was the principal of the school, and she is actually a banker. So that was my hardest challenge. And then when I finished, Paul read the book, and he started giving me stories from his memories. But he needed the words of others to trigger his thoughts, to trigger his memories. And then my editor said, but what about the mother? So then I drove, of course, Suzanne crazy, trying to get the layout of the house to find out what kind of person the mother was, and so on. And she obviously is a wonderful woman, a very creative woman, and the mother to the neighborhood, from what I can gather. So this is my favorite, favorite photograph. And Ellen brought this also, so I think it's probably hers also. Children of Castellar and Leo, and this is how he looked just before he died. But after he died, on a painting that I saw in Palm Springs, I saw the most incredible <coughs> quote that I would have given anything to have in my book. It is so wise. He who works with his hands is a laborer. He who works with his hands and brains is a craftsman. He who works with his hands, his brain, 
and his heart is an artist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and a wonderful overview of uh, Leo's uh, life and, and his work here in Los Angeles. Really appreciate it. Frank, I'd like to go over to you if you could make an opening comment. You obviously have personal interactions uh, with Leo, yes. and maybe you could tell us a bit about that. Would you like to make uh, Well, all right, I'll, I'll speak. If you can't hear me, please raise your hand. Let oh, us know. We can't hear. Okay. Well, Welcome to my backyard. <laughs> well, you have read uh, one of my book uh, where it takes place on Chang King Road, it's actually Chun King Road, which is the next street over. And we live all the way down to the other end, uh, the last building down to the other end of uh, Chun King Road. So that's where we grew up. Uh, my days with Leo when I was young is before Mr. Bill uh, Chen Moon's uh, days at Castle Park. And it was like if you have to realize that back in, in, in the early or early 60s, Chinatown was a, a tourist area where people came to see Chinatown. So the streets of Chinatown were completely packed with, with, with tourists. And we would play on the streets. Uh, Chunking Road was, was my playground. And uh, a little history of myself. Uh, <laughs> If you ask any of the older people back then and who the terror on the street was, they'll tell you it was me. I mean, I was so infamous that my mom was known as Frankie's mom. <laughs> so I know the streets, I know the alleys very intimately. And I was all up and down the street. But I was not allowed to cross the street, so I was okay there. Uh, and one day, uh, I, from my memory, I remember that Neil disappeared. And he was he would sit down, he wouldn't say anything, but he'd bring out a big sketch pad and he would start drawing and drawing and being the naughty kid that I was, this is the uh, one who looked over here and what are you doing? And he says, I'm just drawing. And I would pester him and I would pester him and he would try to draw. And thanks to and I, I didn't know this existed until uh, I started doing the centennials with the Lee family. This is from the music family. Uh, when he was drawing, this was me. On there, he writes on there that uh, he writes about me, uh, but he uses my, my uh, name in the book. So obviously, this was after the book was written. No. But I would, he would try to draw, and I would pass for him, and I would pass for him. And I apologize to Susan and Susanna and Paul, but the only way he could calm me down was to give me horsey rides. And I don't know if he gave them to you or not, <laughs> but he would give me the horsey rides and I would have my fun and then and I would leave. But uh, back then, uh, and even growing up, uh, I never realized uh, what kind of, what his philosophy was behind him. And until I did the centennial, and I started realizing uh, what was behind his work. Uh, you know, I grew up, became a policeman, and part of my beat was Rampart, where he lived, and part of my foot beat was Chinatown and Rivera Street. So, in walking those beats, I had occasions to meet Leo, and even then, I, 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 I was down there talking to him. To me, he was just, he was just an artist, uh, somebody who wrote books, and not realizing what kind of person he was until after <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Ellen, how about you? Yeah. Somebody have a comment? Yes? What was your name in the book? Tommy. The guy with the pink pants. Right? In the cover, right? Uh, this is one thing. There were only two books in, in Chinatown. One boy and uh, uh, Mr. Fong's toy shop. And I just want to acknowledge that Mr. Fong's two daughters, Kelly and Jamie, are in the audience behind us. Can you put your hands up? Thank you. Thank you for being here. This is like living history. Ella, as, as a friend, do you want to give us a little bit? I'm going to stand up for a minute if I may. Sure. Um, I think I'm okay. I think we, my husband and I, 
met Leo probably about 40 years ago and his family, and we made some storyboards, and I just will quickly go through them. Um, years ago, I remember reading in the LA Times that Los Angeles would be eventually a very ethnically diverse community, and I thought, well, that's, I don't understand that. But Leo knew that a hundred years ago. He was probably the most eccentric person I've ever met, but the most brilliant. You know, he believed in recycling. He was so kind. He, he, he was a philosopher. He was an artist. He was a writer. He was a true Renaissance man. He really was. And he was here. He is with his parents. Um, and um, he was Italian. Uh, he loved his mother very, very much. Um, when he was about six or seven, I believe they, and Suzanne's right here, and if I make mistakes, please tell me. Um, they lived in Salinas, and then they went back to Italy. So the book Little Leo is the story of him going back to Italy with his parents, um, and the story of him coming to school with his Indian feathers, and completely disrupting the whole school, and then all the uh, uh, Italian moms made little Indian feathers for their children. I believe he got a scholarship in Italy to go to an art school. He came back as a young, oh, he was in the army, in the Italian army, and if you look over there, he made extra money by doing his beautiful pictures, like the one at the end for the soldiers, and the soldiers would send them back to their family. He came, he went back to Sicily. oh, he came, he came back to America on a freight boat and went through a lot of the Latin countries, and that's where he really developed his love of the Latin culture, and um, went up to Salinas and married his very, very beautiful wife, Helen, who, I've heard him say so many times, inspired him and loved that he was an artist. And this was a long time ago when people weren't really allowed to be um, so different. And she just encouraged him and always supported him. He landed back on the Alvera Street and his aunt said those were the inspirations for so many of his wonderful stories. Um, he lived in South Pasadena and he did do a mural in South Pasadena once and then came back and redid the mural. Um, and I love the story and I don't quite remember it. He and Paul, and Paul was Joe's best friend, um, but Paul and Leo used to go to Dodger Stadium. Um, they loved the Dodgers until um, they uh, changed the stadium and this you know, took so many houses away, and then he never went, he was so angry, he never went back again. So, so I think one of the reasons they also named the school after him is that Los Angeles became so diverse. Um, and he really um, wrote about the diversity of Los Angeles before anybody did, and I've talked to so many people who were either uh, Chinese in um, Los Angeles and Mexican, and they said that was the only book they ever read about their culture. And that, that's a storyboard of a lot of his books. And every one of his books has an amazing story, and it was Suzanne's dog, right? And a very naughty dog, but um, it was a fighter, and he barked so much that he saved the grocery store across the street. So every one of the books has a, a real life story or a real life love about it. Great, thank you, Ellen. And uh, now our, our final panelist make a comment. Alicia, would you like the mic? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here.
you either you, you inspire the person or you find the person closest to them. Because who knows better than them will live with them day in day out. So for me, very, very thing me says Bishop says he doesn't like to talk to the public. But for me, it's very good. Like I shouldn't be here. I must be that. And Paul is not here. Susan will probably she's here, she'll be here. But, so I'm embarrassed to tell you the truth. Yeah, I never met Lee in person. And we got involved in documenting Obera Street when I was studying architecture at USC. And I knew Obera Street when I was a little boy coming here to Los Angeles in 1990. And I found it fascinating. But it wasn't around the area. I just visited it one time, I believe. And I really like the atmosphere, visited Avila Mobi like everybody. But I always remember Opera. Then when I was doing some studies of Opera House for a class of preservation, my mother always gave me a ride, still does. But then when Opera talked to some people, and she had the notion that some of these people might be documented. That there were people that were alive there, that right now they're not. A generation, and there wasn't a certain attention paid to those individuals that had been reviewed, et cetera, et cetera, out of Los Angeles, is a stronghold for history. Now the movement and the free source, very powerful. And more than that, we were just a, a little group. So we started to make new parents. And you realize as you're working over there that it's very complicated place to go through layers of history. And they're all interconnected. And today you walk into Alberta, you'll be taken to Avila Dove, which takes you over 200 years in the past. If you don't understand that past, uh, the, the, the people before the Poladores, the natives, the Poladores, the Spanish period, the Mexican period, the American period, and everything, you don't understand Alberta. And how do you see it like maybe a tourist place? It's much more than that. And how many of you over here have gone to Alberta very often? Probably many of you. And how many of you would feel that if Overa wasn't there, like a big chunk of you was taken away? I don't work. I think somebody, if Leo will be here, he will be young. <laughs> yeah. Because when Leo was in Los Angeles uh, in the 30s, then he first went to Overa. Overa had just a couple of years in there. He was unemployed. There was a very bad depression, like today. And you have this very talented man prepared. He had been to the Italian University on a scholarship, very successful, got a job, and he finds a place like Opera. And he starts to draw, but he doesn't have that easy because supposedly Christine Sterling is the founder of Opera. Christine Sterling. There was a need for people to pay rent. The way Opera works, if you're in the middle, and uh, typically a uh, poor family, uh, Women with children, and no husband, no, no, you will get a stand in the middle. So many times the, you start out with people letting you some materials to sell. And then if you were better off, you would rent some of the spaces on the side. And they were filled with artists. And, and, and what happened with Leo? Well, he didn't really fit. He wasn't an artist that could support himself, but he wasn't a mother with many children. So at the beginning, he, he tells in one of his filming interviews, and for video art, that, uh, that he told us, Christina, I don't have any money to make a living. I cannot pay rent. Also, he had another anecdote. If, uh, if you know Chris, uh, Mr. Bonzo from La Colombina, another very powerful woman in Alberta, but powerful in a good sense. And Mr. Bonzo was one of the first restaurants there. Christina ran it there at the beginning. And she didn't want nothing in front, no questions, in front of her establishment very hard for that establishment. Uh, get a lot of connections with the, the, the political people in the community because she, she wanted that in there and she didn't want to be with either. But it was Miss Calufo, another Italian American, that we were able to interview well, Miss Bolson Dar and Miss Calufo uh, family. Uh, Leda Peluso. She's right here in the state. Also an Italian immigrant, maybe she saw a Leo, this Italian boy. And maybe she has started this wonderful appointment to start with a, with a necessity, but she then came to Spain to work in it. And I tell you this because we see the of the artist, but if you put yourself in his feet as somebody with great difficulties, finding it on their street, and some way, somehow, a means to work in Alberta, then you realize that when you are very young about Alberta, meant for him, I mean, for me personally, finding a job, but for him, he found a place that he dedicated most of his life.
life. I talked to Paul yesterday to tell him that there was anything I should convey here. And he was. He told me, he remember to say that Leo was there all the time throughout his life. We have interviewed and uh, researched about many people in Alberta, people in the Alphabeteers, and different individuals that you see there in Alberta, they pop up at a certain time, they do their contribution, sometimes they go. And but Leo was there for all of his life. He was there in Alberta. Uh, eventually, to the time that he passes away, he touches an Alberta street. There was a tree planted uh, where he touches there that he moved uh, to the front of his profile. And part of him is there. Uh, I just have to bring up that uh, Max, Max's mother's ashes are on the very state, I reckon. It is significant when you think about it that he went there, but he is there still. And, and also, most importantly, too. Close up to bring attention to the mural. The mural was not a very soft body man in, in anything. As a matter of fact, yesterday I, I, in the interview, he mentioned that he was that was very soft from his books, that he didn't think they were that good. So to give you something more, you will do a design, you will think to, now you pray for it, but now at least I give you something to on the book. It wasn't that. At the same time, it wasn't a simply man as we think, as a guy who might think it's a problem. So they have some cartoons for street magazine, political, the oriented, very nice, very balanced, very objective, very stiff. So he, he was more than himself, but I think he made his choice in life. Life is a rough place. He had a, a, some issues in his life with his father, etc. And I what do I want for my life? What kind of life I want to live? And he went completely for the kind of life he did. But self promotion was a part of it. When you see this mural, it's a contrast between the secure mural and him. It makes a parallel. Not the secure was self promoting, but he was more outgoing, more political. Uh, Leo admired his work for Siqueiro, and other Mexican artists. Uh, but if you notice that the difference, you can pass away from this mural. Siqueiro was up as he was there. Uh, Siqueiro was very cinematic in his life. If he was up there, you thought. But I have to ask that I must say that I have gone before I really started to not get into politics. Plus the mural, the mural is not the to stop. You have to stop on the mural. A secret mural was done very quickly because of the circumstances. But the mural took a long time. Different kind of circumstances. And the, it, I was able to really get into the worth of the mural when I had to do a post chapter composition of it for Paul. And then in the computer, when you zoom up, you see the little images. And you zoom up. You realize that it took as much time because he was, he was he'll get into the world, into that world. And he didn't leave it. Not a little piece to see that he heard it. He was about to appear with himself, doing what he liked the most, and knowing that he was going to do something like this for Alberta to be there. So I would recommend. So people probably have done it for certain, but if you haven't had a chance to watch it, you know what Relax, go to the book where it used to be the Mexican council. Relax, be not in a pair. It's not going to be easy. It's easy to me watching the picture in the computer, but if you like, if you want to see the, the dog on the leaf, you're going to have to do what it is. Um, if you want to do the other side, you're going to have to go down, and then you realize what it, just watch it might be hard for you. If I get him from it, an elder man was also known man of time. So that mural he did was one of the most beautiful gifts that anybody has done for Sandy. Uh, and the, that's all the three points I the points I think are important. And then finally, that uh, to bring about the fact that his work deserves more recognition. Uh, uh, the only book other than his own books and some articles I have come up was uh, and stuff as well. I know that family is working on something to bring some of his artwork, a bigger book, to, for him to show the, the art side of him as I the children book. But I think those items have failed for, me for a long time. With all the resources that has the community of Historia have failed. Yeah. Okay. And it's that foolish. You could say it's not in your path to do this. But as good teachers have to come with it. We have a lot of so it's good that in this place that is dedicated to California history, this is taking place. And it brings a promise that we have to see Leo where he should belong to Egypt. Exhibits and lack of 
without a convertible sex which is black one. You say with everybody, you know what? We need things like this black one. And not uh, because he didn't care, the family is not uh, oriented to make it money. But we as a city, and uh, whoever benefits from those, that exposition or, those, or whatever we do from Lillesburg, we benefit. Because again, whatever he does is that for us, the uh, only work is to support that Mr. Benavides mentioned uh, for preservation of the city, of uh, its our, our nutrients. We don't have the history, these are not here. They're not just facts and history. Uh, the, our history is what we enjoy today. When you get a cell phone, there's a history of technology. The scientists don't feel that science starts from scratch. We have a social history, and our places, our architecture, uh, our people, our artists, if we put a, a back to them, we perish like a tree with uh, people goods. Uh, that's what Thank you very much, Fabricio. That was uh, very enlightening. Uh, you can see we have a really special panel here today, and the depth of knowledge of uh, Leo Poletti is very uh, substantial. And so I'd like to open it up uh, because what I'm, being, I'm, I'm struck by here is, first of all, an artist who did his work, I meaning did it really well. He had a vision, and as I said uh, to Jennifer, uh, he was ahead of his times. So what we are seeing today, what LA has become, he already saw it. He, you know, he was a visionary as well, as what Lisa was saying. So if anybody has any comments about what anyone said, and we'll, we'll you know, bring in the, the panel as well. But I want this to be a little more interactive. You're here. You took the time to come. We appreciate that. Any thoughts from anything that's been said from anyone in the audience? And then we can always come back here to the panel as well. Yes. Actually, I'd like to hear from Go Chan Hoon about Leo's relationship with the children at Castle or School. Please, well, please, would you like the mic or anything? I wasn't prepared to take a big <laughs> speech, but uh, I was very close to Leo because uh, I was at the school, Castle Life School, and he would come by every day to a shop in Chinatown. He finally take out and took to Helen and uh, Suzanne and Paul, you know, for dinner. But he would walk back and forth. But in the meantime, he was sketching all the time. He would come to school and he would sketch the kids. Loved children. His life was, I mean, his vision, as he was saying, was a very simplistic life, you know, in Los Angeles. Most of all, multicultural. He loved animals. He loved nature. The simple things in life. So this is what you can uh, say about Leo. He was a very humanistic person. A person who believed in people. And uh, you can see with all of the um, books that he wrote, it was towards children. And it was animals and nature. If you go to Castellar School, you'll see a huge mural that uh, Leo painted. And it was kids that were dancing around in various ethnic groups. Kids, I think there were five children dancing and holding hands, which is, you know, Sim uh, 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 symbolic of being together and children and dancing and animals and, and, and uh, also uh, nature. So um, uh, that was what struck me with Leo is his love of children, his love of people. And uh, as he was saying, it's a, his vision of Los Angeles. Today, multicultural is Los Angeles, multi-ethnic. And uh, it was at this time when he was walking through around Chinatown and all very street that uh, he was, his heart was with with people, with people, and getting along together, working together, loving together, and life together. So uh, this is my remembrance of me. Well, thank you very much. That's pretty good. For my <laughs> I'd like to ask the panel to talk about what is the thing that for each of you really, really strikes you about him as, as a person, as an artist, but, uh, you know, what Bill said, you know, is, is very, uh, I think it resonates with, based on what everyone else said, but anyone, you know, okay, I'll go ahead. Well, this is a man who was very eccentric, I think, um, and especially in a time when it wasn't accepted, you know, um, 
who never promoted himself, never had a checkbook until he was probably about 50 years old, um, never drove a car until he was his son, who taught him how to drive, who, who his sheer genius, I think, propelled him. You know, mm -hmm. every place he, he went, people saw his talent, his artistic talent, um, the fact that he was such a visionary, now we preserve everything. But when Bunker Hill was being brought down, he was at the forefront saying, don't take down these buildings. And a lot of the buildings went to Heritage Square because of Leo. So in my mind, he was such a visionary, such a genius, and such a good man. Um, that's the Watts Towers over there. He loved the Watts Towers. He did a lot of um, stories about the Watts Towers, the song of the swallows was his love for the swallows coming back, but Redlands and Angelino Heights and Bunker Hill were all his passion for not taking things down. Um, the poinsettia was all about his love for it. The different celebrations for the different people. Um, so, a boat for Peppy is a beautiful story. Years ago, I guess the fishermen would go out um, and the blessings of the fishermen. So. Most of these stories are really great histories of Los Angeles. Yes, we have a question about this. Where did he live? Well, it's a daughter can tell you in the house. Is, in the house. Yeah, the house is still there. Mm -hmm. I mean, th th this man is coming across to me as a, as a, as a true you know, Angelino, as we know people who live here in LA today. To go on with this. Anyone else have any comments to make about things that are really striking based on? But this thing, uh, you mentioned Angelino Heights, and I don't know which house I'm talking about when I say this, but Paul mentioned how much the house embarrassed him because Paul came, I mean, Paul Leo painted everything. So to Paul, it looked like House in the Breathless House. And he just hated taking his friends there. And another interesting fact that none of us have mentioned, he never talked about his childhood. And so the book, Little Leo, which shall be somewhere, is his autobiography and his only autobiography. That's the only thing that he wrote about his life. But for school children to read about themselves in books was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And it made such influence. This man who named Fleety School said, when I saw myself in the book as a child, I felt, now I can do anything. And he became one of the superintendents of school of the It just gave was him that, that sense of power. Richard, Richard Alonso. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very interesting. In fact, he named the school and then kept moving up. He says he used to go to the Central Market every week, Mr. Alonso with his mother, and he, he met Leo there, I believe, well, you, you probably know the story, but that was his influence to learn how to read, you know, and from learning how to read, he went to college, he became a, a superintendent of school, so he was very influenced by Leo. Now, is the house in Angelino Heights still painted the way that your dad did it? No, that house was on the street. Ah, okay. It was two blocks away. And was, was any of that preserved? No. Okay, he had such vision. It's 20 years before Esther Jack Keats wrote about black children. You know, I mean, he was so far ahead of his time. No, it's true. As everyone said. You know, he, he really, he really was. Actually, you can see that. Also, and the heights is like the historical landmarks. So it's So is there like a plaque or something there at that house that, that uh, your dad lived in? So that's not so frank. But, and just to piggyback on what you uh, said about uh, dad's line of the books, and this is a, a 
kind of a personal story. Uh, my sister, a woman, was born in Tucson, Arizona. And we had a grocery store back then that we had purchased from uh, relatives. Uh, we lived there a couple of years, and then, uh, then we ended up moving out here. Uh, at that time, uh, they had two sons. The relatives had, had two sons, and the younger son uh, was, I think, born just about when my sister was born. So I never really got to meet the younger son. So we fast forward to uh, maybe about 10 years ago, and I ended up meeting this, uh, this uh, the, the third son. And uh, uh, we got we got we got to be friends, and and, and, and we talked to. On the night that they had the, past, the South Pasadena uh, show there, or the exhibition there, I was at his house, and I was talking to him, and, and, I, and we were talking, and I said, hey, you know what, I have to go, uh, we have this thing on the uh, real TV, and, and he says, no, please, I said, yeah, I said, yeah, we, and he, he didn't know about one of us, so I said, yeah, this one of us was based on all our family, and, and turns out that his family is three boys and one girl, just like ours. And the younger daughter identified with the book and ran into her room. And because they could not find a copy of the book, they had photocopied it. And says, This is what I identified with. This is this is this this was us. We all said this was our family. And and they, they were just so happy that, that, that someone had written a book at that time that uh, that showed the, the, the Chinese culture and, and, and Different diversities. So that's my personal story about, about how we identify. And this is 40 years. I mean, there's a difference between myself and the kids about 40 years. And they were still identifying. They were still identifying. And that's a great story for me because that really says a lot about you, your dad, and, and, and uh, the lady's vision about what uh, people are all about. You know, as you were saying, uh, Bill, he loved children, but he also captured something about what was going on. He was very observant. Uh, Fabricio, do you have anything to add? Yes, I just need a quick thing. I forgot to mention about uh, an anecdote about Jennifer South, who's a script writer, whose father, Waldo South, was one of the partners. So, a flat list of dialogue, you know, really big house at that time. But she told us a story, she was like, oh, I should have killed myself when we see that. Hey, she really the one who nailed for us the importance of living. Because she tells a story that when she, she called herself Marina, she comes from a Jewish background, and she's American from so, so here, but she wanted to be called Marina when she was a girl. She said, oh, Marina, Marina. Because she, <laughs> she, loves, she loves the book Marina. And this baby we're talking now is over 50. She's now doing one of those scripts for television. But say uh, yes. And um, we wonder why Marina. She likes the book, but she said, no. There's a part of Marina actually it took her more than the first time that we saw it took her. Maybe a couple of months since she told us, you know, now I realize why I love Juanita so much. There's an image of Juanita where there's a mother doing the little girl, cuddle. And she says, and I remember when I was a girl that my parents were going to do coffee and I didn't feel so so close like that. But when I, when I read the book, I now realize that was really one really thing that Juanita for me. And the police, she saw, mentioned it to me, and and it's always when you see this work, was not fascinated by it. That was very important, that image of the mother with the, with the son or daughter. And he was always trying to work it out, his culture and painting. It completes itself at him because even there was something there for him personally. He conveyed it in one ear, and just like what the track mentioned, it really touched somebody very important. That's all for that. Well, thank you very much. Emotional resonance, and you, you know, and your quote about it, he said, you know, when you put it all together, you're an artist. And, and but he created emotional resonance for people. That's what I'm, I'm hearing from what Frank said in the useful story about what people receive is that, that bond, you know, and that's really about love. And so thank you for sharing that. Uh, any other yes, Ellen, go ahead. Well, um, I remember when Harmony was born and we were all right to the Helen, um, Helen's house, and it was always a big adventure, and my husband and I would talk about it. <laughs> but they couldn't quite remember what Harmony's name was. <laughs> what did they say? It was just what's 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 the new baby's name now? <laughs> it's harmonica. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Paul had three sons. 
son and said they'd talk about going to Leo's house and spending the night. Leo would paint and they'd hear it. It's three young boys and they drink coffee with them all night and paint with them all the way around the kitchen table. Um, so they, they were pretty amazing. I wonder if I could give us a, a, a saying or something. Sure, go ahead, please. I'd love to yes. read it. Well, I'd be happy to, of course. Okay, because I think it embodies so much of Leo. So I'm just going to find it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And what did you write this for? It was written that this is for Parker's, I wrote the passage in 19, 1934. It gives me goosebumps. <laughs> That's right. Right. It's, right. it's called No Barrier. From a playground, we watch the children play. Some are light under star, but they are all beautiful. All of them have a life force and baby little bodies. All of them run, play, laugh, and cry, and yet, if I were to do a different thing, I would do the same emotions of life. Each enjoys living all, and will later be in the arms of the mothers who love them, live for them, and raise them to be good and kind. If we can only understand this force that makes them live, the same love between mother and child, the same desire that you and I have to live, the love, aspirations, dreams like your mother with you, my mother with me, and no dogmas, no prejudices, no fears, can stand barriers between man and man. That to me is such an appropriate voice. Thank you very much, Ellen, for bringing that. I mean, we can see we're dealing with a genius, we're dealing with a visionary, we're dealing with someone who uh, I believe, hopefully, with this panel and with the, you know, Sharon and the studio team, can begin to have you know a, a revival of uh, interest uh, and also honor this man's work. Um, I'd like to encourage all another round of applause for this fantastic talk. I'd also like to say a big thank you to Jennifer Escobar for curating this amazing event. Uh, she did all of the work involved in it, which, as you can see from all the different players in it, it's very hard to do. <laughs>